In the last video, we left off talking about how the change in the price of a gross substitute for labor could affect the demand for labor. And we said that if labor is farm workers and the price of uh, machinery that substitutes for farm workers goes up, then that more expensive substitute is going to make farmers actually demand more workers. They're going to want to substitute away from the more expensive equipment, machinery, towards the relatively less expensive farm workers. That's going to drive the demand curve to the right. It's going to raise the wages of farm workers and the number of transactions in the labor market. Let's pick up from there and look at what happens when the price of a complement, a gross complement, changes. And let's say that the price of the complement goes up. Well, a complement is something that makes the farm worker more productive. Let me use my cleaned up version here. Stick with farm workers. And it could be a technological um, resource. It could be a machine that doesn't substitute for the farm uh, worker, but instead is a complement. It actually enhances the ability of that farmer uh, to uh, produce. If the price of the complement goes up, then that's going to lower the demand for the farm worker. You're going to see a new equilibrium at the intersection of the new demand and the original supply, and that's going to cause lower wages. So wages are going to drop and that's going to cause less transactions. Okay. Now, with that information behind us, let's put together the model as a whole and just remind ourselves that the market pursues equilibrium and changes in the labor supply determinants and or the labor demand determinants will shift these curves to the right or to the left and you will have a new equilibrium. The process of adjustment from an initial equilibrium to a new equilibrium is wage adjustments. So you now know why wages change. Wages change because some supply determinant or demand determinant have changed. An equilibrium has been lost and wages are adjusting to restore a new equilibrium. We now have a model that allows us to understand wage determination. The next thing to do is look at, for any given wage, how firms go about making the employment decision. Because ultimately, firms have to decide how many workers to hire given the wage rate. And so we're going to walk through that. And the process of doing this is initially going to be very unrealistic. We're going to make assumptions of a perfectly competitive market. While unrealistic, they will give us a benchmark from which we can then modify the assumptions or nullify the assumptions to actually understand the real world. So it's a starting point, nothing more. These assumptions are as follows. There's a large number of firms independently demanding workers. That is, the firms are not working together to create a collective demand. They're working independent of each other when they make their hiring decision. There's a large number of qualified workers independently supplying their labor. In other words, the workers are not working together collectively to determine how much uh, labor supply to create. They're making that decision individually. All jobs are identical, homogenous. Wage taking market determined firms and workers. So we know that firms would always want to pay a lower wage and workers would always want to receive a higher wage. Doesn't matter what they want. What they get is the market wage that is determined based on supply and demand we discussed previously. There is perfect costless information. The workers know everything about the firm they need to know to make the labor supply decision. 
and the firms know everything about the workers they need to know to make the labor demand decision. There is perfect costless labor mobility. There is no cost to taking a job in LA, New York, Bangkok. Labor mobility is 100% free. With that in mind, now let's look at how a firm makes the employment decision in a perfectly competitive market. When we say perfectly competitive market at this point, we're assuming perfect competition in the labor market, meaning the firm is really going to be a wage taker, and perfect competition in the product market, meaning that when the firm sells its product, it's going to be a price taker. Another way of putting this is the firm will be able to hire as many workers as it wants at the market wage and it will be able to sell as much of its product as it wants at the market price, but it has no ability to control the wage or the prices it sells for its product. The effect of this on the supply side is a perfectly horizontal or elastic supply curve. The firm will see its supply curve equal to its marginal wage cost, which will be equal to the wage uh, that it takes to get workers to come to work, to show up. On the demand side of the labor market, the firm will see a downward sloping demand curve, and that demand curve will equal its marginal revenue product curve and its value of marginal product curve. If you're a little uncertain on what these terms mean or why we would get this downward sloping demand curve for labor, it might be worth revisiting Chapter 5 where we cover those nuances in more detail. But for us now, a perfectly competitive labor market and a perfectly competitive product market create this graph. And the firm then simply profit maximizes. Remember, the goal of firms is maximum profits. And that means it, they're going to want to employ more worker hours so long as the marginal revenue product they can get exceeds or equals the marginal wage cost that they incur. These are the metrics, marginal revenue product and marginal wage cost, that the firm uses to decide the employment decision. So in their eyes, demand is marginal revenue product and supply is marginal wage cost. They're equating the two to get the firm level of employment. What about society's perspective? Society is a broader concept than just the firm. The firm is in charge of the employment decision. We got that. But that doesn't mean that society is not affected by it. Society can be thought of as all the consumers that benefit from the product being produced. And for them, it's the value of the marginal product of those workers that matters. From their perspective, the demand curve for labor should be the value created for consumers. And from their perspective, the supply curve of labor should be the wage curve. That is, what does it take workers to actually show up and work? From society's perspective, the optimal outcome, the most efficient, is going to be where the value of marginal product curve intersects the wage curve, which you'll note is the same outcome here that the firm chose. So this is a unlikely but optimal environment because the firm will make a employment decision to maximize profits that will be the same employment decision society would choose to maximize efficiency. Therefore, the pursuit of profits aligns with efficiency. And the firm's goals and society's goals are aligned. But we know that that perfectly competitive environment is not realistic. So let's move ahead and consider what is realistic. The first example of the real world might be where we maintain perfect competition in the labor market. That is, we have wage takers uh, for firms, but we make the product market where the firm sells their output imperfectly competitive. We're going to stick with the broader definition here imperfect competition, 
But you may recall from prior classes that this is really either monopolistic competition, oligopoly, or monopoly in those product markets. In that environment, the firm is a price maker. They can actually choose the price they're going to sell their product at and then accept whatever quantity uh, demand there is at that price. But let's first note that we're in the same position in this example in terms of the supply side of the market as we were before. If I back up one slide, this was the supply side in the previous perfectly competitive example. Notice it's the same. So this firm sees a supply curve that is equal to its marginal wage cost curve, which is equal to the market wage. However, because we have imperfect competition in the product market, we're going to see the marginal revenue product curve, which is the firm's perspective on labor demand, it's going to be lower than the value of marginal product curve, which is society's perspective on demand. And this divergence, and let me just go back one so you can see the difference, in the perfectly competitive environment, they were aligned. But now we go to here and you get this divergence. This divergence means that society is going to have a different goal than the firm. Let's start with the firm because they're in charge of the employment decision. So how many workers are they going to employ? Well, we know from their perspective, they look at the marginal revenue product and they look at the marginal wage cost. That's their metrics. And they employ up to that point where they intersect. So the full the firm will employ at QF. But society, they don't look at marginal revenue product and marginal wage costs. They don't see that. They see value of marginal product and wage. They want employment to occur to where these intersect. And that's right here, QS. So what we have is a profit maximizing outcome that the firm uses to make the employment decision here but a efficiency maximizing output that society uses here. Society wants more workers employed than the firms are willing to employ. That creates an underemployment of labor. This is inefficient because society is saying these units from QF to QS, these uh, units of labor, have value greater than the wage that it would take a worker to produce that. You can see this if we shade it in. So this area here, from society's standpoint, is value of the marginal product of the worker greater than the wage at which the worker would need to show up for work. But these units of labor do not get employed because the firm doesn't see this as profitable. In fact, if the firm employed these workers from here to here, they would actually see a marginal revenue product less than their marginal wage cost. Each of these hours of labor would bring about a increase in cost greater than an increase in revenue. That would subtract from their profit. So they would never do that intentionally. But society says you should do that because from consumers' perspective, the value that those workers are creating that is their marginal product times the price is greater than the wage at which it would take the worker to actually show up for work. So they see value where the firm sees losses. Firm is in charge of production. We stop here. We don't get to here. The employment decision is inefficient. Now, you may notice that what's happening here in the labor market is very analogous to what would be happening in the product market. We don't need to draw that out. You will do that in your uh, intermediate micro or your introductory micro course where you look more specifically at product markets. But when you look at imperfect competition in those markets, you're going to see that firms are going to underproduce the uh, product. Well, if they're underproducing the product, then wouldn't they be underemploying labor? So it, it lines up. 
Imperfectly competitive firms produce less output than society would want them to, and they employ less labor than society would want them to.